<laughs> okay, welcome to the uh, after morning tea session and uh, carrying on with Tom Eastman to talk about reporting. There's actually a lot more people in here than I expected. I kind of figured everyone would be in the uh, Ninja Talk. Um, what I'm talking about here is a project that was put on my plate when I first got to my new uh, place of employment, when I first got to Catalyst, and it was kind of to help break me into how they run things over there and maybe throw me into the deep end a little bit and maybe just give me a bit of an education. Um, and also do a favor for the system administrators, because the system administrators at Catalyst do an amazingly fantastic job under quite a lot of pressure. And um, it's always great to be on their, on their good side. You don't want to be the person who annoys the sysadmins. Um, you never want to be the person who annoys the sysadmins. Um, so what they came to me with, let's see if this is, ha, cool. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking sort of in general terms about CouchDB and basically just how it works in, in very general terms. I was thinking about turning this into a bit of a tutorial, but I didn't end up getting slides for that. Sorry. Um, the problem that the, sysadmin, the sysadmins came to me is the one constant thing that they always have to deal with, which is knowing that everything is working all the time or when it's not. Um, there's a million different monitoring systems to do this. All of them are a pain in the ass in their own way. Who here has used Nagios? It's awesome, isn't it? It's really good when it's... <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nagios is fantastic when it works, and it does work really well, and it's just a real pain to configure. If you're trying to set up a plugin in Nagios, let's see if I catch all the steps. You've got to set up the plugin on your machine, Configure NRP to know about the plugin. Configure Nagios to know about NRP, knowing about the plugin. And then, I'm sure I've missed a step and it'll probably break anyway. But um, if you spend more time configuring your monitoring tools than you are monitoring your systems, then it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, what, they, what they wanted from me was something that would help them deal with scripts and cron jobs and email. Who here is a sysadmin and gets automated emails all the time? That's the other fun thing. Um, you, you try really hard, if you're running cron jobs every night, you're running backups, you're running system checks, you're running all that sort of thing. Even if you try and cut down the signal to noise ratio as much as you can, if it's working, keep it silent, you're gonna get somewhere in the realm of in my old job, it was only about 50 to 100 emails a day. The sysadmins at Catalyst get somewhere in the realm of several thousand emails a day. Um, and you don't care about any of them unless something's going wrong. And you don't, it's not often obvious to tell whether something's going wrong in the first place. You can set up all kinds of clever filters. but. One thing that a filter won't protect you from is what happens when an email isn't getting through. Um, I had a backup system that emailed me every time a job was done. I would get 30 or 40 emails a day because one for each server. Um, if you're getting 997 emails a day, how do you know if you've only gotten 996 on a particular day? If something stalled, if something went wrong, if the script failed, it might not have actually gotten as far as sending you the results. It might be hung, and you might never actually see that. Especially because you start tuning out the sheer amount of noise that you're getting. Okay. What we needed was a way of knowing if something had not checked in on time. And what the sysadmins asked me for was something that looked good on a big screen, something they could have in their offices, which basically just said, everything's great. So that they would be able to look at it and have nice, friendly, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy things saying, don't panic. And since this was Catalyst, it needed 
kittens. I don't know why I'm not a cat person, but the first thing that they ask you when you go to Catalyst is, tell us about your cats. Um, so that's what would be really nice, is for the sysadmins to just know all day that everything's fine. And that's actually quite an easy thing to achieve. All you have to do is make a web page where you say everything's okay, even when it's not. Um, I offered that, but they said that that might be counterproductive. Um, what they really wanted is something that would show up on screen that would tell them if some automated system that hopefully they usually don't have to think about needs some attention. Um, and they wanted it to be, you know, not another whole big Nagios-like thing with 10 different steps to configure. As something that's as simple as humanly possible, um, you probably can't get away with zero configuration. You probably, magic doesn't quite exist without it falling over in all kinds of interesting ways. Um, but to make it as simple as possible for a sysadmin to actually use the tool means that the tool might actually get used. Nagios they use because they have to, there isn't really anything better and it's a pain. But if you're gonna throw another thing into the mix, it better be really, really lightweight. So that's what I wanted. I wanted a way for them to be able to report the result of whatever script or cron job or task they're running as simply as possible and preferably only in one place. And then leave the rest of it up to them. So what sort of information do sysadmins actually want to be able to know about a job? And the answer is whatever. <laughs> you don't know what they're interested in because every job is different. Every job has maybe, if it's a backup job, they might want to know how long it took, how many files, you know, how large the job was, whether there was a problem. Um, the things that you probably know you want are what the job was and whether it worked. Those are good things to know. But even whether it worked might be optional. Um, so what I wanted to do was set up something where it was as simple as possible for them to set up and they could decide what to do with it. They could basically send whatever information they wanted. Um, yeah, so simple obvious thing like whether it worked, anything you wanted. Being able to send any kind of diagnostic information is pretty handy. If something did go wrong, you can send files or ISOs, maybe, if you wanted to. Um, the fun thing for me about being handed this project was I'm writing a tool for system administrators. System administrators have a tendency to want to control their tools and make sure that other people aren't abusing their tools. If a sysadmin wants to abuse the tool that I wrote for a sysadmin, that's what they're allowed to do, absolutely by definition. So basically, if I could set this thing up to be entirely as ridiculously flexible as possible, whatever weird use that they decided to use it for, I would just run with it. I would just go, oh, okay, you want to use it for this crazy thing that I totally didn't think of, okay, because I'm working for you guys on this. I'll make it do what you want it to do. Um, let's see, I already said that stuff. Okay. So, the information that we want to be able to send in. <clears throat> like I said before, I wanted to keep it, the minimal requirements, absolutely bare bones. So in the end, the name of the job is the only crucial piece of information, and everything else is optional. The host name is probably as important, and I don't think you'd ever want to leave that out if you were doing any kind of monitoring, but, uh, yeah, maybe I should have proofread my slides. Um, actually, I already know of a few more errors in there, too, so I'll point them out, too, so that you can all laugh at me. That's all good. Um, host name is optional, but if you include it, it counts as part of the unique ID of the task. So if a task is being sent in every day, the host name plus the name is the ID of the task. If you don't provide a host name, then the host name just is ignored. The status is optional. 
Um, I went with Nagios statuses. Basically, OK means everything's fine, and anything else means you probably want to look at it. And then this is the other thing that was the key point, is that when you send in a piece of information to the server, you tell it when to expect the next one. Um, uh, that's actually another error. It's not reports in, it's reports underscore in, but who cares. Um, if, you, if it's a daily cron job, the key thing that I wanted to be able to achieve is if, it, if it's a daily job and it takes more than, say, 25 hours before the next one comes in, you might want to know about it, or 26. Um, I wanted to make it so that the job told the server when the next one should come in, so that the server then already has the information it needs to know, oh, this is kind of late. We should probably let them know that something that we were expecting to show up hasn't shown up yet. And then other information. And arbitrary key value pairs, often to infinity. They can throw as much as they want at this thing. I threw ridiculous amounts at it just for the fun of it, but really just in testing. OK. Actually getting this information to the server. The simplest protocols, again, are the most flexible, the ones that everyone understands. You could set up some kind of socket thing. You could set up some kind of UDP thing. You could set up all kinds of things. In the interest of keeping it as simple as possible and also navigable through whatever bizarre network setup you have, just sticking with the things that we know always work. HTTP and email, even if you're deeply segregated, even if your network is massively behind DMZs and firewalls and whatever, if you know you want to get an HTTP request out from this particular server to this particular server, you can pretty safely poke a hole through your firewall for that one thing. Um, and for the few places that you can't do that, usually you've also got email configured. Uh, the system administrators at Catalyst figured that if it could handle these two transport mechanisms, then in all of the machines that they administer, there was two that still couldn't get out. Um, and those two, they were embarrassed to admit existed anyway. So I don't really know what the, was going on with those. But if they're kept in a locked room behind locked doors, behind segregated networks where not even an email or HTTP can get out, I, I don't know what that means. But whatever's on those computers scares me. Uh, however, having said all this, HTTP is at the moment the only thing that's configured. Email is a to be implemented. And then if you're using HTTP, actually reporting information becomes as simple as using curl. Sending an HTTP post. That's um, what you're looking at there is the bare minimum thing to actually report to the server. And again, this does require you to put, to edit your cron jobs to actually update information this way. Um, but you don't need to configure the server. The server will receive a post and it'll go, oh, there's this new task. Let's just trust it, which might be a risk of its own. But again, I was writing it for the sysadmins. If the sysadmins want to protect it, then they should. <laughs> But doing it this way really does mean that if your machine has curl, which is basically all of them, then you're pretty much ready to go right away. Um, that command line is just an HTTP post sending the equivalent of a form submission with a whole lot of key value standard HTTP form pairs. And the cool part is curl will also let you just send arbitrary files. So in this instance, if this was some kind of backup with some extra information that you wanted to do, you could attach whatever diagnostic information you'd want to, and it will send that file to the server. And in the interest of just it being ridiculously flexible, I don't know. Um, I didn't actually try this. I think it would be suicidal, but also kind of funny. <laughs> um, it's probably, that actually probably would fail in a, in a, 
We could try it with the live demo server that I've got running right now, but let's not, because I don't know what that would cost. Okay. The back end is built on Django, and rather than using SQL an SQL database to store this stuff, because of the flexibility that I wanted to actually implement, and also because, let's be honest, this was actually kind of a learning tool for me as well as I was writing it. Um, if you wanted to store something like this in SQL where you're really not defining what you're gonna store, you're just saying store arbitrary name value pairs, you're not gonna be able to take advantage of the usefulness of a relational database. You're gonna end up with a database table or a, or a Django model which is gonna say, here's my request and here's a list of keys and values and your columns are just gonna have to be, you know, ID, key, value, It'll be hard to index, it'll be hard to search. And I wanted to play with CouchDB. So <laughs> that's what we've ended up using here. It's got a Django front end and a CouchDB back end, which is a bit of a challenge in its own right. The, the Django front end was not, that was actually because that was the tool that I knew at the time. And in truth, it probably should have been something a bit more slim like Flask or Bottle. Has anyone used Flask or Bottle? I haven't and fully intend to. Um, who, who saw my talk yesterday on horrible things in Django? Yep. Okay. Why wasn't this in that talk? As in drop, not using the database at all. Because <laughs> it would have made the talk so much more pleasant. Um, actually, here, I guess maybe this was an immune response reaction. For this project, I didn't use the ORM at all. This project is, and again, this is why I should have stuck with Flask. I started using Django to interface with Couch, and as a consequence of that, tried to avoid using the ORM at all. So at the moment, the application is not using any of the Django stuff that requires you to do a sync DB. So it's not actually using Django's session middleware, it's not actually using Django's authentication middleware, all of that stuff that requires database tables. This is not um, as straightforward as mapping CouchDB onto Django's ORM. I didn't look at that. I wonder if someone has, but that's way out of scope. What CouchDB gets you is a document is just a chunk of JSON. And a chunk of JSON is key values and other chunks of key values and arrays. Being able to throw unstructured documents into an unstructured database is probably a good way of using an unstructured database. I don't want to get into a NoSQL versus SQL fight because I think they're both a lot of fun. Um, but what CouchDB does give you is a way of efficiently storing key value pairs and also of attachments. So those files like the log file and dev SDA, which again, probably shouldn't try it, um, will end up being stored in CouchDB in a reasonably efficient manner. So in CouchDB, what you end up with is something that looks vaguely like this. So that's information which is automatically included and information which the, was specified on the curl command line. Who's read this before? Oh. So querying CouchDB is its own little interesting challenge. Except, luckily, you don't have to write your distributed MapReduce function in Erlang. You get to write it in JavaScript. By the way, I didn't know JavaScript when I started this. I learned JavaScript later. Never use CouchDB's distributed MapReduce function implementation as a tool to learn JavaScript. <laughs> um, <laughs> the reason being, it doesn't give you any feedback on what you've got wrong. So if you do that, okay. Skipping ahead. Basically, you don't know if you got the syntax wrong or anything. When you write a CouchDB view, a view is basically 
a definition of an index, and an index is basically what you end up using whenever you're doing NoSQL stuff. But essentially, this is a JavaScript function that runs over every document in the database and just spits out, uh, using the emit function there, spitting out a key that will go into an index. So what this is doing is it's going through every report. Sorry, is that still? Yeah. It's going through every report and grabbing the host name and the name and the timestamp and throwing those out as the keys in an index. And what you end up with is an index that allows you to find all the documents based on that information. Uh, let's see. So the things that we wanted to be able to index in the most immediate sense are tasks that had any kind of error reported and tasks that may or may not have been successful but hadn't showed up in the last, or were outside of the window when you were expecting to get the next report. And really that's about it. But the rest of it can just be collected forever for diagnostic purposes. You can find everything you need. Let's see. So at this point, the back end is there, but the front end is still very much a work in progress and you can mine the information out of the system that you want to find. Um, one example that we did, as one of the first things that sysadmins thought would be quite handy to have, is whenever they're sending in any kind of report that has any kind of numeric value, being able to pull that out, index it, so that you can build charts and see like if the size is going up or the duration is going up. Um, and being able to auto-discover that information based on sending in numeric data. Now. Let's see if I can actually get this to work. Oh, actually, this is where I have to admit that it is still very much a work in progress. <laughs> How do I get out of full screen, Dina? F11. Actually, annoyingly enough, I do need to get out of full screen because I need to get to the other web page. How about we quit? Oh, it'll help if I use the other mouse. So, this is the current front end, and at the moment it actually doesn't include kittens. Um, so it's not release worthy yet. It, it, it'll, it'll, hit the, it'll hit the beta stage or the, or the first release stage as soon as the kittens are embedded in it. The front end was kind of thrown together at the last minute. The back end is, part, is the part that kind of exists in, in a real sense at the moment. But the key point is basically just having front and center errors that are currently need attention. Um, Let's try. Is that readable? where I find out that I should have used capital F. Yep, afraid so. Sorry. Now, this is also where I make sure that my live demo happens really fast because it's completely open to the entire network. And as soon as the people who are live streaming it realize that they can <laughs> post their own things. Um, so one, one thing that I'm hoping will be very beneficial out of this project is 
These charts should be very fast to retrieve because they're being indexed as they go into the CouchDB database thanks to the view. We need to use it in anger before we really know that. As you can see, and to be honest, I've just shown you uh, the entirety of the front end, mainly because we have had a fairly limited amount of time to get that sorted. And then, you know how I said I didn't know JavaScript? So a very talented, a very talented JavaScript person at Catalyst, Matthew Holloway, uh, did the front end for me in his spare time. And then I had to change the complete back end API. And it was a bit of a rush job to get everything fixed at the last minute. But that's probably the extent of what I can show you at the moment. Are we pretty close to time? OK. Um, this is going to be on GitHub very shortly. And I will tweet where that is as soon as it shows up. Um, I guess, yeah, it's a work in progress. But it's, it's a bunch of ideas that I'm pretty keen on just because I love the idea of zero configuration on one end so that the system administrators can basically just have fun with it. And then its use will be able to evolve from there. They're going to they're gonna throw a lot of data at it and go, oh, well, we, sh we wish it did this. And if we're lucky, we've designed it to be flexible enough to just be able to pull that out and make it ready for them to use. Um, thanks a lot. I think that's about all I've got.